bringing you news and updates from the Alliance of American Football, your source for everything Memphis, with your hosts, Dan and Michelle. This is Memphis AAF. And welcome, flight crew, to the latest episode of the Memphis AAF podcast. This is your captain speaking. I am Michelle, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Daniel. Daniel, are you excited to recap the QB draft? I am, because it was... (laughs) I don't even know where to begin. Uh, shock and disbelief, I guess, probably be the two adjectives I'd use. I think that's pretty widespread throughout the league and everything. Definitely. just And not even from us. If you watch the draft, you probably know what we're talking about. But also just from a lot of the other teams did not go the way they had expected it to go. Right. But first, we've got some news. And we're also going to bring you an interview or discussion, I guess, with Isaac Simpson, who writes for the blog. He's a sports writer, but that's going to come later. Yeah. So first of all, we want to, uh, I guess, give a Band-Aid and a little uh, pat on the back (laughs) to our friends over at the Fleet Speak podcast. They tweeted out something that uh, got a little bit controversial, maybe. It's kind of funny because when you tweet (laughs) at someone, I guess you don't really expect for them to see it or reply. Especially when you consider who they uh, tweeted at. Right. So tell us about it. As you probably know, because we mentioned it in a previous episode, the lead analyst for the AAFQB draft was none other than the man, the myth, the legend, Kurt Warner. And I think we talked about it in a previous episode, but obviously best choice to have be the lead analyst. Uh, But we talked about that more, I think, in the last episode. Yeah, definitely. So be sure to check that out. Our friends over at the Fleet Speak podcast decided to tweet at Kurt Warner. Yeah, this was in response to something that he said that Kurt Warner said during the the draft, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Dan showed me this whole interaction. And I guess um, this was in response to something that Kurt Warner said during the live stream about Scott Tolson. So the Fleet Speak podcast said, love the optimism from at Kurt 13 Warner. But at 31, I got to believe Tolson is as polished as he's going to get. To which Kurt Warner replied, Nowadays, guys are playing till 40. I didn't get my first start till 28, and I got better, question mark. So, uh, bam. Yeah. In your face. I saw that, and I just had to leave a reply saying, damn, getting called out. (laughs) Because like you were saying, you don't expect, uh, whenever you tweet at these higher profile people, you don't expect them to acknowledge it or even reply. Right. But uh, Kurt Warner had to quickly step in and say, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, let's give this guy the benefit of the doubt. And so, like, please speak, like, decent of him to reach out, though. Kurt's one of the good ones. And uh, one of our early followers, the title of Vance, at TayVS underscore SD, who is a Fleet fan, um, he said, you caught the attention of Kurt Warner. Oh, snaps. Hi, Mr. Warner. I'm a fan if you're reading this. To which Kurt Warner replied, thank you. Oh, that's so cool. (laughs) So, Kurt Warner, all around good guy. Uh, Fleet speak, hopefully you can recover from... That epic burn from Kurt Warner. But yeah, here's a little Band-Aid for that wound. Yeah. If you haven't already, go ahead and check them out. Fleet Speak podcast. They do a lot of great content. So at the watch party for the Kiwi draft on Tuesday, uh, there were a lot of people from the team there, obviously. Koshe Irby, the president of the Memphis Express, was there. And he was walking around. And we got so much information. I tried to take notes on everything so I could remember it and talk to you guys about it. Um, but one of the things that he talked about once the uniforms were unveiled was all the technology and the cost of these helmets. Yeah, because he was saying that a normal helmet costs in the realm like $400. And these are going to be so much more expensive, like multiple to that, because of the technology that's in them. So apparently they'll be able to like read body temperature on the guys. Yeah, I mean, a whole lot of measurements can be taken from these helmets. In addition to like body temp, another thing they're going to be able to do is quantify the impact of a hit on the helmet. Yeah, so they can see like... You know, the team can have an app on their phone on the sidelines and they can see where the dude got hit and how hard. Right. So if he was concussed, but maybe doesn't know it or wants to keep playing, they'll be able to pull him just for safety and say, like, you need a minute or whatever. They'll be able to take care of that as opposed to letting him go out. But like you've said to me before, the the danger in a concussion comes not only in the first hit, but like in the second and third. I mean, all these repeat hits, maybe because you don't know you're concussed or you don't want to go out. But the team will be able to see how hard you were hit, and make that decision safely. And get you out of the game on the first concussion before major damage sets in. Right. Uh, Another thing that we learned whenever the uniforms were unveiled was a little bit about why the colors were chosen. As you guys probably know, if you have listened to this podcast before, I have very strong feelings about the name 
and the colors. And there was something, I feel like there's a little third thing to round out this group. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But anyway, Cochet was saying that during the process of creating these uniforms, there were things that they had to fight for, one of which being the color blue, because the Liberty Bowl, where we'll be playing, is blue. Memphis Tigers play there. Their colors are blue. They're different shades. This is more of a navy. The Tigers have more of like a lighter blue. Anyway, so one of the reasons they went with that, obviously, was the Tigers. Which makes sense that you want to have that color match, even if it's not the same shade of blue, still make it look good together. Because if you look at the Stallions, they have like shades of blue and like either white or silver. It's still kind of ambiguous based on the images we've seen. But if you look at their stadium, it is predominantly red. Like the end zone is red and like the sidelines are red. So unless they're willing to repaint all that, then, you know, that's going to clash. And then like a lot of the seats are red. So it's unless you like sell out every game, Mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of red to clash with that blue. Right. So that kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense, which is why the blue of the Express makes sense. But I still have an issue with red, white and blue. That's been like a color combo since even before 1776, because those are France's colors and France was around since, well, I don't know how forever <laughs> they adopted their flag, but still, I mean, red, white, and blue is the least original color combination you could ever fucking come up with. Oh, and someone on Twitter was like, it's patriotic and Memphis is patriotic. Uh, literally every city in America is American. What makes Memphis any more American than Los Angeles or Boston or Right. Podunkville, Louisiana. Well, I would say that if you were going to go with those patriotic colors, it would work for Boston, Philadelphia, or Washington, D.C. Those are like the three most quote unquote like patriotic America cities based on historical events. Exactly. Um, And that's why the Patriots are red, white, and blue. I mean, different shades, like it's silver mostly, but because it fits there, but it doesn't fit here. Yeah, the blue fits, red, white, not so much. Yeah. Uh, Something else that was uh, some knowledge that was dropped on me, although it came from Jacob, who is salty that I don't like the name. (laughs) Yeah, and Jacob was, I think, on episode 14, uh, but he came on to talk about the season ticket. So you can go back and listen to that episode. But he was saying that the Express has to do with logistics. And if it wasn't for logistics and Memphis being a trading post, we wouldn't have molasses and therefore we wouldn't have barbecue. So since I hate the name Express, I must hate Memphis barbecue. But it's not like you don't have support. I was actually going through and I saw that we had another review on iTunes. So shout out to you guys. And then I have like a report of like all our reviews. And the very first review was from username J is for James. Really? Yeah. And he came to your support when we did a live stream about the uniforms, I think. Yeah. On Tuesday. Yeah. So you do have uh, somebody in your corner about the name. There's at least one other person. (laughs) Feels as strongly as you do. So I have reached a point of acceptance. I'm probably going to start trying to talk about my hatred of the name and the colors a little bit less, but just know it's still there. Uh, so moving quickly on from that, something else that we uh, we heard on Tuesday at the watch party is that Koche had a little bit of a campaign going, trying to get uh, trying to be the QB for the Memphis Express. Yeah, but apparently Mike Singletary said that if Koche was the QB, the league would fold. <laughs> <laughs> so not a whole lot of support from the coaching staff, it seems. Yeah, I don't see that happening. <laughs> But Greg, uh, he is the VP of marketing for the team. He has his own campaign to push Cochet out of a plane. Uh, yeah, if they sell like a certain amount of tickets, Cochet is going to skydive. And someone even said like you should skydive into the Liberty Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be fun to see. Cochet did have a caveat that he's going to have a parachute. But if they sell, a, we don't know the numbers or anything. Um, but they sell a certain number of season tickets. We can get our president of the team to jump out of an airplane. So, guys, let's get on this. I want to see Koche skydive. I know you do. So make the push. Try to get uh, people to buy your friends, family, maybe a Christmas gift for some people. Let's get these season tickets sold. Because not only will that get Koche out of a plane, it'll also show sponsors that this is a sustainable league. Hashtag do your part. Let's do this. All right, so that's all we have really for the news. Really not really news, but just kind of our experience at the event. And let's talk about the actual event and not so much the draft. Okay. So first reaction, not great. Um, It was just really cramped, really loud, really crowded. And I think that's actually kind of a good thing. I don't 
So it seems like the team was not expecting the turnout that we got. I did talk to Luke or Dan, who worked for the team at an event earlier in the day at the coat drive, and they did say that they were expecting quite a turnout. So I think that they were actually. Well, that's kind of crazy just because like how small the space is. Maybe that was intentional. Yeah, because it looks more crowded and maybe that makes like the hype feel more. Maybe. I don't know. It was just like it was hard to move around. There's a lot of standing and like not a lot of seats to go around. And this one motherfucker. Oh, my God. One fucking asshole was just standing between two tables, just like standing there. And I mm-hmm. went over and I was like, hey, are you, can I sit here? And he was like, no, I'm reserving him. Yeah, for like 45 minutes. An hour? He was reserving eight seats, two different tables by himself because his friends were going to show up or something. Yeah, I don't know. And no. this was an event that was standing room only at that point. And we got there at fucking six o'clock and there was still nowhere to sit. Yeah. Yet this one motherfucker was reserving two (laughs) fucking tables. If you listen to this podcast, you're an asshole. And I stand by that. All right. Well, there you have it. So another thing on Tuesday that I saw at the at the watch party. Do um, tell. Do tell. So it was at B Dubs or Buffalo Wild Wings. Okay. So first of all, do people call it B Dubs here? Because that's all I call it. Right. That's all I've called it. I mean, that's what it is in St. Louis. That's that's what I started calling it when I worked there. And I know it is a Buffalo Wild Wings saying because they put up on their poster board or like on their chalkboards, B-dubs. Right. That's just what we've always called it. What do you guys call it? <laughs> Let us know. So w- the watch party was there. It was really crowded and really loud. So we couldn't really hear. But one thing that I saw in like the video intro package to the draft was that the AAF chose these cities because they were, quote unquote, Football starved cities. What do you think? Um, uh, wrong <laughs> is what I think. I, 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 I give me. I had a puzzled look. <laughs> Obviously, I can't communicate just because. <laughs> so overall, I guess the majority of them, I would say yes. Yeah, that fits for some. So Orlando, I would say, doesn't have a whole lot. Birmingham doesn't. Birmingham, Memphis, um, San Antonio. San Antonio. They've wanted a team for a long time. They really? Got it. Yeah. San Diego, I would agree with. Right. Uh, Salt Lake City. But Phoenix and Atlanta, I'm going to have to say no on. They Definitely have not. a professional NFL team. And Atlanta has like two other like semi-pro or amateur leagues. Yeah. Like uh, arena football or something. So I wonder like what the decision was to go to Atlanta and Phoenix if their tagline was going to be football star cities. Like did yeah. they get some sort of sponsorship or do they know someone or? Or maybe they weren't expecting anybody to look this deeply into it. But it's pretty obvious. <laughs> but I do think something super quickly, a little sidetrack to go off here. A football starved city that's getting a team is St. Louis. Oh, yeah. I We completely overlooked that. Yeah, XFL is coming to St. Louis, apparently. Which we kind of called. If yeah. you go back to earlier episodes, we talked about expansion in the AAF and or the XFL, uh, you know, the fact that St. Louis would be a great city for that. Yeah. And I think the AAF almost went with them, but it was down to like St. Louis and whoever we picked up last. And I think the other city just either like committed sooner Mm -hmm. or whatever happened, but it was like that close to St. Louis being an Alliance city. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense because as I'm sure you're probably familiar, the Rams were there up until what, two years ago. Something like that. Yeah. And then they wanted a more expensive stadium, but they hadn't even like the current stadium, which is, I don't know if you know much about how stadiums work. It's paid for with tax tax dollars. A lot of it is, yeah. And the city hadn't paid off this first stadium. So there was no way in fucking hell they were getting a second one. I mean, I'm from we're from St. Louis. We can tell you that the city was pissed. Yeah. And whenever they said, well, we need a new stadium, we're going to leave, the consensus was get the fuck out of here then. It's not happening. So I think, but there's been kind of a hole there. I know that uh, my stepdad hates the NFL because of the way all of that went down. And there's a lot of huge football fans there because it was a football city. So it makes a lot of sense to bring in a new team to really feed that hunger. Yeah. But what was really cool was they did a couple of giveaways. Yeah. I think they gave out like tickets to a game and a signed football. Yeah. And then they gave away a jersey, one of the inaugural jerseys. Yeah. So it was a raffle that you kind of signed up for when you got there. And whenever they were doing the giveaways, I was like, God damn it, they're going to pull my name and they're going to make me take this jersey in front of everyone and accept it because it's in front of everyone. But it didn't work out that way. But we did get to see like the jersey in person. Yeah. If you saw any pictures from any of the watch parties, they had mannequins with the jerseys on and and helmets and everything. And I got to say that helmet looks way better in person. Yeah. it's. I mean, you already liked it, but it looks so much cooler. Because yeah. it's matte. It's got a really cool look to it. 
And if you haven't seen the pictures, um, just imagine if you saw like the mannequins or like the models they've had this entire time with that kind of deep red. That is essentially our helmet uh, with the one that was at the uh, the watch party. Right, right, right. With the two jets meeting with the jet streams in the back. I love it. Yeah, I really like the helmet. And not to be biased or anything, but it is out of all the helmets. It is my favorite. Not my favorite jersey, but my favorite helmet by far. But we'll be doing a full recap of the uniforms and helmets, not here, but in a YouTube video. Yeah, we did it on Instagram Live, so sorry if you missed it. Not sorry, you missed it. <laughs> Next time, be a little bit more on the ball. Uh, I'm talking to you, Shipyard Podcast, who <laughs> didn't make it in time. But if you do want to see our reactions and our opinions and our emotions about the uniforms, then um, go to memphisaaf.com slash YouTube, and there you'll, you can find uh, the latest video. Which also be sure to subscribe while you're there because we are going to be putting out a lot more content on YouTube right now. It's just entire backlog of the podcast. Um, but we are going to be doing a lot more, especially once the season starts, hopefully getting some video uh, analysis. Right. And we definitely have some content in mind. But if there's anything you guys want to see, let us know. You can find us on social media. You can email Dan at Daniel at Memphis dot com. There you go. Um, and also, we're going to be going to the tryouts. So we'll hopefully have some footage of. Uh, you know, some of these guys trying to make the team. Yeah, we're getting our equipment prepared, so we've got that all set up. Yeah, maybe we can uh, talk to the coach or something. Oh, shit. How dope would that be? All right, so I think we've exhausted the news. I don't let's, think there's anything more to talk about. Let's get into the discussion with Isaac. All right, let's do this. We have Isaac Simpson with us today. He is basically a sports writer for all things Memphis sports. Isaac, how you doing? I'm good, man. Uh, really good, man. Excited about uh, the AAF. I, I love the love the platform. Love what I'm seeing, man. We had the the, the quarterback pick and protect draft last night. Uh, really, really enjoyed that, man. And I think it's a going to be a bright future here in Memphis with the Express. And I'm I'm excited to get started. So before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do for Memphis? Yeah, uh, I, I'm with Rivals uh, TigerSportsReport.com and cover. Uh, talking men bas- men's basketball, women's basketball, football, uh, basically just basically a beat writer uh, for for the teams, cover recruiting, uh, cover the games, and it's it, it's fun. Uh, I, I enjoy it. Uh, it's my alma mater. Uh, I'm a big fan as well. Uh, basically a lifelong Memphian. I was born in San Francisco, actually, but I've, I've been in Memphis pretty much all my life. So um, I'm like, so I call myself a lifelong Memphian. So it, it's fun to be able to cover the, the local university and especially – with what's going on now with, with Penny Hardaway and what could be coming in the future. And Mike Norvell's done a fantastic job. The, the foundation was laid by Justin Puente and Mike Norvell's coming in and taking that baton and even taking it even farther. So it's, it's an exciting time to, to cover Tiger Athletics. I think with all the programs, even Melissa McFerrin in women's basketball uh, has a really nice class coming in next year, and I think they could be on the rise as well. Um, it's been a struggle for them over the last several years, but I think that could be – Something about to turn around. So it's a good time, man. The AAF is it's starting up. Uh, so uh, a lot to be excited for. Uh, and and I, I enjoy and, and support anything uh, Memphis. Uh, if, it's, if you have Memphis across your jersey, I'm going to be a fan of you. And I'm glad we have the opportunity to be a part of this first year at the AAF. Uh, it's going to be fun. I, I love everything they're doing. I love uh, even I would think one interesting thing that I, I saw with the tickets. They have these. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but if you're going to actually – have the seats on the field, uh, which is something I don't think I've ever seen at a, at a, in a football uh, setting. I mean, they have seats on the field, uh, the VIP seats right there on the, in the corner of the end zone. I think that's going to be a unique experience for some fans as well, the fans that purchase those seats and tickets. So I, I, first class, everything they've done. Uh, Kosha has done, done a really good job, and I think they're doing a really good job getting the, the message out uh, the, the, from the merchandise to, to everything. I, I'm excited. I think it's going to be a really good really good deal and i'm excited to get started and and be able to cover it yeah and he's going to be helping us you know create content for the show and especially once we get closer to the season um you know he'll be offering a lot of analytics and a lot of insight about what the express is doing and how the team is performing did you make it out to the watch party last night i i didn't uh i wasn't wasn't able to make it out i I wish i could i'm definitely definitely going to start making it out to more events in the future but i heard it was a a great time i saw uh kosha actually Tweeted about it on Twitter and, and, and thanking all the people for coming out. And so I heard it was a great turnout. Yeah, I definitely don't think that they were expecting uh, <laughs> the kind of turnout they did because it was pretty cramped where we were. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
but it was a lot of fun. It was it was great to see that kind of support for the team, especially since yeah, there's not definitely. a whole lot going on. Yeah, uh, definitely. I I think uh, like I said from from everything that I've read. I mean, you look at this league. I mean, from platform media, I think. I think one reason why, and we've got to talk about this before, one of the reasons why a lot of these other leagues like the XFL the first time, the first iteration of that years ago, failed because their platform was basically as they came out as competition for the NFL. That's kind of the way they sold it. And the the AAF is kind of kind of coming out and, and planning on working in lockstep with the NFL, maybe even becoming kind of uh, uh, similar to what they've done in the NBA with the D League, uh, working in lockstep with with the NFL, I think that really helps. I think the partnership with Vegas and you're able to be able to vote on the game, the, the bet on the games. I think that I think that's really good. I think that'll help. Uh, great TV deal with CBS and great coaches. Uh, as we see, you know, you have to look no farther than Mike Singletary here in Memphis and the, the crew that put this thing together. I think there's really good people with Heinz Ward, Troy Palomalu, and the people involved, ever saw involved with this. I think I think this thing is going to be a success and. And I'm ready for it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, one thing that they're really doing well is working with the NFL because during yeah. the preseason, the NFL, you know, our coaches were attending the games, working with the NFL coaches to evaluate, you know, these bubble guys that were playing in the preseason that yeah. weren't going to make the roster to kind of scope them out for the AAF. And just to see that the NFL is open to that tells me a lot about what. Th- it tells me a lot about how the NFL views the AAF and about kind of how the future may look. And like you said, get more of a partnership with the NFL. There is a boy uh, that, that's been there. And I think AAF is something, like you said, at a, right, at a great time to, to kind of step in and feel that boy. Um, I, I think because you look at what they're doing with the NBA, the G League, and you look at those smaller rosters, I think it's even more important for football because there's so many guys out there, uh, so many guys, talented guys out there, cause, and, and you get – uh, because teams are so big, and you have so many of these guys that play really well in college and don't make it in the NFL, and they're really either they're going to, to the CFL, these other leagues. I think being right here in the, in the United States and having the TV deal, these guys are going to be on TV every week. Uh, and great coaching. I mean, I'm impressed with some of the names that we've heard. Um, I said you go no go no further than Mike Singletary here in Memphis. I think that shows you the commitment uh, of the people that put this league together to be able to get a, a Hall of Fame football mind like Mike Singletary as a head coach here, former NFL head coach for your 49ers. I, yeah. I think that's something really special. Um, you got Steve Spurrier. You got a lot of big names uh, in this league, and I think that that's going to help as well. And it even goes down to the coordinators, not just head coaches. They're good coaches all around. So there's a lot of depth here uh, in, in the coaches that, that we that have been hired so far in this league. And uh, I think it's going to really help these players develop. And I think a lot of these guys are, are going to be able to, to move on and possibly – get in the NFL for the first time or, or get back into the NFL uh, by, by showing what they can do down here at AAF. Yeah, absolutely. And like we said before, you know, the AAF is going to be playing NFL style football. And so like the players that go to the, the CFL or even like arena football, they don't have, yeah, you know, scouts can't evaluate them because the style of the game is yeah. so different. And that's where the AAF yeah. can serve and show what these guys can do with NFL style football. All right, so let's just get into it. What what are your thoughts about Tuesday night? Definitely uh, the quarterback tech or pick uh draft uh, took place on CBS Sports Network, which again love that love the fact that they have that T V deal. But uh yeah, not going draft, but I, I think it was a, a special night. I, I like what the Express got done. Yeah, so let's let's kinda break this down round by round. So first round they choose to protect. I think everybody, at least, you know, 90% of people were uh, convinced, <laughs> yeah. you know, we we're going to go with Zach Met and Bacon Cheeseburger. Um, yeah. And then to the shock of, I'm sure, everybody, they went with Troy Cook. Yeah. So, like, tell me, what are your thoughts about that? Like, what were you thinking whenever that came out? Um, I, just like just like you said, I was shocked. I, I thought for sure they, they were allocated uh, Zach Bettenberger, and I thought they would protect him. And when the pick came up, Third pick in round one. I'm still, still not exactly sure what they were doing with the the, the draft orders. I'm still kind of confused on that. It was kind of weird uh, from round to round how that took out. But yeah, I, I think with both people following the draft, I think we all thought Zach Benberger would be that guy. But they take Troy Cook, uh, 23 years old. He played at at UT Martin. He's originally from Miami. Uh, walked on at Florida State, where he was the scout team quarterback. Uh, won a, a championship with them on that 2013 team. I know Jimbo Fisher talked a lot about. 
that year about how important he was to, to help that squad and help Jameis Winston, uh, who was the quarterback there at that time, now with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, get ready for games. Uh, he's 6'2", 215 pounds. Uh, like I said, transferred to UT Martin, played 20 games over two years, uh, throwing for 34, over 3,400 yards and 32 touchdowns. Uh, not not quite as accomplished as some of the other guys, but it, it, it's obvious Jim Will Lewis saw something in him. Uh, I, I guess you, you go back to what I said about Jimbo Fisher. I've heard how professional a guy he is, how great of a locker room guy he is. And, uh, I mean, he, he's a good football player. I was UT Martin's a small school. He hasn't been in the NFL, doesn't have the qualifications that or, or resume that some of the guys they drafted later had. Uh, but uh, Jim Will Lewis thinks, and Coach Singletary thinks he's, He's a guy. Uh, he's shown that he has leadership qualities. Like I said, great locker room guy. And maybe he, he thinks he's the guy. I know they say he played a similar style to, to what they're playing to play at, at UT Martin. I think that helps as well. So if they think he's the guy, we'll see. Uh, but I think he's going to have a, a lot of competition. But uh, like, as you said, I think we were all kind of surprised that, that Zach Mettenberger well, was his name called for the Memphis Express yeah. there. And as soon as you know they said Troy Cook, we were – shocked you know michelle and i were there and so we immediately pulled coach a aside and said what is going on and the one thing he said was <laughs> is that when they interviewed him you know it's that he grew up with the silas the he grew up in the system that singletary is one to install and so the fact that he already knows what's going on they can cut his training time, like how long it takes him to learn the playbook and learn the system, they can cut that down immensely. And whenever you have, you know, training camp is a month long, you know, we're going to have many camps in December. Um, but if you can, you know, eliminate as much of that learning curve as possible and get him actually practicing the system, it's going to move him so far ahead of some of these other guys that's going to take longer to learn. Yeah, especially with the amount of time that they have to get ready. Because, I mean, we thing get kicked off in, in February. We're here uh, almost December now, so not a whole lot of time uh, to get these guys acclimated. And when you talk about the quarterback position, they have to learn a lot yeah. <laughs> in a short short amount of time. So if he's a guy that has already is used to this, what they're trying to run, I definitely understand them wanting to go with, go with that guy. Uh, but I think we were all kind of surprised. But you, you go into the second round, and a lot of a lot of guys still on the board. Uh, I think especially you, you look at. The, the broadcast, I think the two guys they kind of highlighted were Christian Hatton, Hackenberg and, and uh, Zach Medberger, uh, who both ended up with the Express, uh, which is kind of kind of kind of unique. <laughs> uh, I don't think they they thought they'd end up on the same team, but Hackenberg was the guy that I wanted. And when, when I talked about that on Twitter last night, I know a lot of people kind of kind of sneered at that that idea. Uh, big guy, big quarterback, six four, two hundred thirty pounds, uh, twenty three years old, originally out of. Layton, Pennsylvania, was a fantastic player at, at Penn State. Uh, was a second-round pick of the New York Jets back in, in 2016. Uh, he played those. He played there for two years, had stints on the practice squad to the Raiders, Eagles, and Bengals uh, earlier this year. But big, strong guy, huge arm. I mean, he can, can throw the ball deep. He can really struggle with accuracy uh, in his times with, with time with the Jets. But I, it, it is no disrespect to the AAF, I think – in this league, I mean, a guy that was drafted drafted second round uh, in the NFL, I think these are going to be NFL, quite NFL defenses that he's going to be playing against. And with his big arm, I, I think he has the opportunity to be a really good player for this team because uh, I think he can throw the ball deep. But you go back to his career at Penn State, I mean, 8,318 yards, 148 touchdowns. I mean, he was a tremendous college player. I, I think this guy has a lot of good football uh, ahead of it. Uh, sometimes you, you get into a situation like he did with the Jets and – Things just don't work out. I uh, really struggle. But, again, like we talked about earlier in the segment, uh, it gives these type of guys uh, another opportunity. Um, and, and a lot of times guys can flourish in that role because they're homeless. Uh, they, you know, like you said, you watch out of the NFL, but but you get this second chance and you don't want to waste it. Um, and I, I, that's one of the reasons why I really wanted them to draft Hackenberg because I, I think size and talent-wise is there. I, I think he just has to get some things figured out, and I think he, he can possibly do that on this level. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about how, you know, it's not quite the NFL level that the defense is that he's going to be playing against. I know it's not the same thing, but whenever I, you know, start playing Madden, I usually have to turn down the difficulty a little bit just so I can get a feel for the game before <laughs> I can turn it back up. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. that's a great way to put it. Uh, definitely a great way to put it. But uh, I, 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 like, I like him. Like I said, big, big quarterback, hard to bring down. Um, and like I said, he, his accuracy was, was his issue with the Jets. Uh, didn't have that problem at, at Penn State. Uh, so 
we'll see. But uh, but I, I think if they can get in there and work with him, I, I think he has the opportunity to be a good player. I think it's going to be quite the battle uh, for the Express with, with the four quarterbacks we have here. I, it's going to be interesting to see who comes out of it. I know Troy Cook is the guy that he feels more advanced with their system, but I think if you look talent-wise, I think they have guys that are just as talented as him that they took later on in the draft. Yeah, so let's go ahead and move on to our third pick, Brandon Silver. So this is somebody Brandon I'd never Silver. heard of. Yeah. Like, you know, Troy <laughs> Cook I knew because he was allocated to us. Hackenberg and Mettenberger, obviously, yeah. you know, they're well-known names. But this guy I'd never heard of. So what do you know about him? Yeah, he, he's kind of a, 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 a unknown guy as well. Small, Another small school guy along with Troy Cook. He played at Troy, 24 years old. He's a uh, – you saw there's a theme here. He, he's big, big quarterback. He's 6'2", 218 pounds. So he's a – a, a tall, stocky guy as well. Uh, originally from Pensacola, Florida. Played at Troy. Uh, he broke Sam Bradford's completion percentage uh, record for a freshman. Um, his first year at Troy. First team all Sun Belt back in 2016. Uh, not a big-time athlete, uh, but he, he, he doesn't move particularly well in the pocket, but has a good arm. Um, he's an accurate. He's a bit of a bit of a gunslinger. Uh, he did have a kind of a, a interception problem um, at Troy, uh, but he's a guy, I mean, another developmental guy, another small school guys, so I'm not sure we really know what we have in these guys. A lot of times you'll, you'll see these, these small school guys and they'll come in and perform and, and surprise them. Uh, so I, I don't think a lot of people know a lot about Brandon Silvers. I don't think he was a name that was really on anybody's radar, but but we'll see what what they have in him. Uh, but he's another small school guy to go along with Troy Cook, and, and, and we'll see. But very very similar resumes uh, that, that, that we saw with Troy. Uh, so both from Florida, both played at, at small schools in the South, and both end up with this press, so, so we'll see. But Brandon Silver's six two two and eighteen pounds, and I, I've, I've watched some tape on him, and he, he he's a guy he likes to sling the football around, and I think that was his issue, or maybe why he didn't make it to the NFL because he does have a tendency to kind of force some throws in from from what I've seen on tape. Uh, but he's another guy that they can bring in and develop, um, and I think he's going to be uh, right there in that battle with the rest of the guys. Yeah, I don't have anything to say about him just because I watched the highlight tape of him and it seemed like his accuracy was a bit off. Like he made all the throws, but it seemed like it could have just been a little bit better. Yeah. Like, you know, guys had to slow down or like come back to the ball. Uh, but other than that, I don't know. So it'd be interesting to see how everything shaped up during training camp and to see kind of who stays on the roster, who gets a starting gig and kind of what happens with the team. Definitely. Uh, but Moving over to our last pick, and I think yeah. it's so weird to say they still end up because I think we thought this would be the first pick, but Zach Medberger at uh, 27 years old, 6'5", 224 pounds, a well-known name around here. I've uh, had a two-year stint with Tennessee mm-hmm. Titans, uh, short stint with the Chargers and Steelers as well. Uh, the Titans drafted him in the sixth round of the 2015 draft. Uh, started 10 games uh, for the Titans, uh, throwing for 2,347 yards, 12 touchdowns, but he did throw 14 INTs, and I think that's the reason why he, he's no longer in the NFL. Uh, did have a problem with actually did throw a lot of picks. Uh, but as I said with Hackenberg, not not exactly NFL defenses, and you, and you got guys that, that have that NFL experience. I, I think that really bodes well for these guys going into camp with a, the, into this competition with the AAF. I think talent, if you look at overall talent, I think Zach Medenberger, who they got in the fourth round, might be the most talented out of the yeah. four. Not only was it a shock that he wasn't protected by Memphis, but I think the biggest surprise was that he was still available with the last pick for Memphis. Yeah, I mean, it's weird to me. Now, there have been some, some, some thoughts at times that he doesn't have the greatest work ethic and maybe that he doesn't care about much, care about football as much as, as he should being a professional football player. And I think maybe that played a part in it. I know these guys, uh, they, they interview these guys, and they talk to these guys a lot, and I'm thinking maybe that's the only thing I can yeah. think. Maybe he – didn't interview well, didn't, didn't like body language in the interviews, and he slipped. But but talent, I don't I don't think talent is his problem, especially not on AAF level. Now the question is going to be how much does he want this? Does does he want this opportunity to, to show that he can still play and possibly get back to the NFL? Um, he's he's a little he's the oldest of the group. Uh, like I said, at 27 years old, and what, does he really still have that desire to, to play football? Uh, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, and it actually makes a lot of sense that you mentioned you know being apathetic or you know having the right work ethic you know just thinking back to his rookie year with the titans you know he got a lot of criticism for you know taking selfies before the game and being a little more lackadaisical when it came to it, even to the point where jj watt mocked him and if we know you know one thing about mike singletary is that apathy is not (laughs) acceptable at all in any degree (laughs) 
<laughs> and he will call you out on it. No, he's not a guy that's going to put up with anything like that at all. I mean, he, you got to give 110% every time you, every snap, every practice rep, you got to give 110% or he's going to call you out on it. He's not a, he's a, uh, a no BS type of coach. So you, you're not going to be slacking around on a, a Mike Singletary coach team. That's yeah, absolutely. Sure. All right. So based on our four quarterbacks, Troy Cook, Brandon Silvers, Christian Hackenberg, Zach Mettenberger. Do you have any kind of insight or any kind of speculation as to what they may be hoping to do with our offense? Um, it, 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 it's, it's, I don't know. It's different because they, you got, you got a, 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 a weird mix of guys here. Uh, Troy Cook is, like I said, he's only six one, but you got the two big guys in, in Zach Mettenberger, Christian Hackenberg that don't move around a lot. Troy Cook is a guy that can, that can do some moving. I think he, at his pro day, ran a four six forty, which is really good for a quarterback. Uh, so he has a little speed to him. He might be a guy that can that actually get out to the pocket and, and run a little bit. You're not going to see Mettenberg or, or Hackenberg running a little bit. They're, they're definitely pocket yeah. quarterbacks, big arm quarterbacks that go sit in there and sling it. Uh, so I don't know. It's, it's interesting. It's an it's a interesting mix. And But it appears that they think Troy Cook is the guy that they want to lead the offense. And I think if he is the guy, I think you could see uh, – Maybe what you call it, a, a little bit of an air raid offense. They think a little bit of what about what, what SMU runs. Uh, but I think Troy Cook is that kind of guy that could run that offense. Chris Nackenberg and Zach Mettenberg aren't those guys. So if he's the guy, I think, I think that's the kind of offense we can see. Maybe more of a, a, a RPO type of offense than a, than a stand back in, in the pocket and throw it offense, which that might be one of the reasons why they like him. I think he brings a little bit more versatility than those guys, even though those guys have a little bit more experience with having their time playing in the NFL and had bigger causes and put up bigger numbers during their college career. I think the fact that that versatility that Cook could bring may be what wins this thing for him. You know, that makes a lot of sense. I know, you know, how Mummy's no longer the OC, but, you know, Singletary is the one who has is his vision for the offense that they're going with. And if he yeah. saw, you know, how Mummy fulfilling that vision then, you know, he might be looking a little more air raid. And even though, you know, we don't have him as you yeah. see anymore, maybe that's still kind of that kind of offense that he sees mm -hmm. Troy Cook being able to take care of. Yeah, I, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that could could be what we're looking at here. But I, I think those guys are going to push him. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this battle because, I mean, to have two guys like that, that, that like in Hackenberg and Bedberger that have played in the NFL and, and have that experience, I think they're going to be, they're going to they're give uh, this coach staff something to think about. Uh, I think Troy Cook, like I said, doesn't doesn't have that same resume. Uh, now, that doesn't always matter. Like you said, some guys just in the coach's vision, Cook might be that guy. But we'll see uh, throughout camp. But I, I like the group of guys that they got. Like I said, Brendan Silvers is kind of a, a unknown guy. Uh, but we, we, we know that Medberger and Hackenberg, and we know that, that this coach staff really likes Cook. Uh, so it, it should be a fun battle throughout camp and it will, we'll see who comes out, who's the backup, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's going to be a great battle every day uh, with, with these four guys. Yeah, absolutely. And you only have to look to Adam Thielen to know that it doesn't matter where you come from. You know, it doesn't dictate exactly. your ability. Great example of that. Adam Thielen, uh, a guy I can't even remember what school, Lake something college in, uh, yeah. up in uh, Minnesota. I can't remember where I think you came like from. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, right now, arguably the best, wide receiver in the NFL, if you look at that numbers, uh, really impressed with what he's been able to do. And he's definitely a true representation of that. And I think this this league uh, as a whole, I mean, is a, a great representation of of guys and, and giving guys a, a second chance. And small school guys, uh, you, like I talked about earlier with Silvers, you never know. Uh, Silvers could come in and pull him away and be a really good quarterback. Uh, play to Troy and doesn't get the, the notoriety that a lot of these, these other guys got. Um, and uh, a lot of times those guys are hungry um, and we'll see what he brings to the table. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm hoping for Mettenberger is that maybe going so late in the draft, he might have a little chip on his shoulder and he's going to yeah. really have a fire under his ass. Yeah. Cause you, I mean, you could see them while sitting back there in the, in the room. I think him and <laughs> I felt so, Hackenberg kind of shocked. I felt so bad yeah, for the guy. Was still sitting there. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Cause I, I'm sure he expected to go first round hands down. Uh, I, like I, I'm sure he probably thought, that he would end up going to Memphis in the first round. That's what we all thought. But, yeah, it was a long wait back there in the, in the room for him. I, I, I felt sorry to see him back there as well. Kind of had him and Hackenberg on early interviewing the guys as basically being like the top two guys in the draft. Yeah. And it didn't work out that way. But it, it's weird that they both both ended up in Memphis. I'm, I'm not sure people expected that. Yeah, that's definitely a surprise. All right, so to kind of 
move on from Memphis specifically. Was there anything with the rest of the league, any of the other picks that really kind of stood out to you as either being really good or really bad or just a complete surprise one way or another? Um, as far as the draft overall, I don't know any specific picks. It, it was kind of surprising that you saw a lot of these small school guys going before some of the the bigger names, the names names that that the guys that played in the NFL and guys that played uh, at, at bigger colleges. I mean, just you see Brandon Silver's going um, in the third round. I mean, we had a lot of a couple guys, in, Troy Cook uh, going the third overall uh, to Memphis was a surprise, and I think and I think I don't know if it's a testament to the vision of the league overall. Maybe they they want to go with the younger guys and, 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 and young development guys instead of going over. I don't want to necessarily call them the retreads, but guys that are still a little bit older that have been in the NFL or played bigger time college, college football or played in some other leagues, maybe they want to go with these young small school guys. And I think that's one thing that kind of surprised me that we saw a lot of those small school guys that don't have the name notoriety that some of the other guys go early in this draft before other guys, um, like Hackenberg going in the, in the second round. You had Medenberger going in the fourth round. And, and those are two names that talent-wise you thought, oh, man, these guys would be first off the board. And you that's not what the case. You saw a lot of these guys from small schools going, guys that not a lot of people know anything about. Um, and, and I think that's interesting. And that's going to be something to watch because I'm, I'm not sure if we exactly know what the, the true vision of the league is. And then maybe it, it is the development of development guys and, and develop guys to possibly get them to the NFL. So we'll see. But that's the thing that kind of stood out to be overall for the draft. Well, awesome. Isaac, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun. I love getting this kind of insight uh, into the quarterbacks. So I'm going to ask one kind of controversial question. But before we get to that, where can people find you if they want to follow you or kind of find out more about you? Yeah, you can follow me, follow me on Twitter at I, Isaac underscore rivals. That's I-S-A-A-C underscore rivals. Always on talking Tigers and, and sports in general or whatever else may be on my mind. I consider myself to be a decent follow. So if you, if you want to give me a follow, if you're so inclined, man, go in there and, and give me a follow again at Isaac underscore rival. For the last question, we're going to get into a little controversial area. It's something that's a point of contention on the show that we have with the team. But what do you think of the team name? Um, I, I, I like it. Um, I, I actually like it. I know I, I've heard a lot of people that don't. Uh, there, there's a lot of fans that told me that they're not big fans of it. The, the Grizzlies actually thought about naming themselves the Memphis Express when they first moved here, changed it from the Grizzlies. Um, they, I think they had a vote and they decided to keep the Grizzlies. But I like it. I like it when, when you think about Memphis being a, a, a transportation hub. I think it fits Federal Express. I like the colors. I like the red, white, and blue. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a fan of it. I love the merchandise. I love the helmets. I'm I'm a big fan of it. I know some people aren't, but I, I like the name. I think when, you, when I look at all the, the names of, around the AAF, I think I like Memphis is the best, and that's not just being a homer. I think it really, really is the best as far as the color scheme and the name. Well, that's awesome. Um, you, have you seen the uniform yet? I'm sure you have. Yeah, yeah and I, I like it. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what did you think of them? So I thought the uniform was a bit generic, but I think that just comes from the color scheme. Uh, I think, you know, red, white, and blue have just been so overdone that yeah. having a that. jersey like that, it kind of looks like off the rack type thing. But the helmet, I, I love yeah, the helmet. The I love awesome. the that gradient, yeah. yeah, and then they actually had they had the uniform and the helmet at uh, at Buffalo Wild Wings oh, last, the other night, and like it looks even better in person because it has kind of has like this. Uh, it's a deeper red and it has like a matte look to it, yeah. and it looks amazing. Yeah, that's what I said. I love the love the matte helmet today. I know that's what it looked like in the photos. I love those. Uh, the, uh, a new design that a lot of teams are going for now, and I, I love the matte with the red. I really like it. Um, I, I like it. We'll see uh, it, when when, it, when they're out there on the field and what it looks like. But uh, I'm a fan of it. I know I know a lot of people aren't, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see how it looks. But but as of right now, I think I'm a fan. Well, awesome. Um, Isaac, thanks so much for coming on the show. And, guys, he's going to be on the show a lot more once we get back, uh, once we get closer to the season, Definitely. offering a lot of insight and a lot of analytics into the team. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't. And make sure you follow him on Twitter. Uh, just because he does offer a lot of great insight. If you are into Memphis sports, um, he's the guy to follow. Isaac, thanks again so much for coming on the show. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. I have some thoughts. Okay. Uh, uh, hopefully good. <laughs> well, in response to Isaac, yeah, sure. Okay, great. Uh, one of the things he said was that the Grizzlies was considering the name The Express. <laughs> um, oh, but I knew you are going to love that. Obviously, they didn't go with it because it's fucking 
fucking stupid. Okay, everything that I said about letting go of the name, I guess, is not happening. Right out the window. Because obviously it's stupid. So the Grizzlies passed over it. We've heard about how other teams have considered it, but they didn't go with it because it was stupid. How do you really feel? It's stupid. Okay, get anything else? <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> All right. I think that pretty much sums it up. So let's move on. Another thing I wanted to say about the interview was I thought that Isaac made a really good point about um, how important it's going to be that these games are televised. For sure, because we were talking about in a previous episode of how like all the players are more likely to come to the AAF or choose the AAF over, say, the CFL or AFL or you know arena football just because of various reasons. But one thing we didn't mention that Isaac brought up is that the fact that they're going to be televised makes it even more accessible to NFL scouts as well as NFL fans. Right. And that's another thing that's going to make this league last is that it's going to be visible and that these players will have a bigger shot because it's televised. Right. So like one thing I talked to somebody about is that arena football, it's hard to find like televised because it's something that you need to experience. It's better in person. So it makes it harder to grow. But with the AAF, every week there's going to be a televised game on CBS Sports, but every game is going to be streamed on the app. So there's no reason why you can't watch every game. Yeah, so if you're doing anything but watching the AAF on a Saturday... um, Don't know what the hell you're doing with your life. I really don't. Drop everything, open the app, and watch some football. So I do want to talk about Singletary for a second. All right, let's do it. So I mentioned in the interview of how it's his vision for the offense. So like the big thing, the big question going into this for me was what's that going to look like without an offensive coordinator? How can they choose the quarterback if they don't know what their offense is going to look like? And I reached out to the team. And essentially what their response was is that this is based on Singletary's vision. Whoever they choose for the offensive coordinator is going to be based on what Singletary's vision for the offense reflects. Right. And so it doesn't matter if you have the coordinator or not going into the draft because you still have Singletary, which is a really, really good move on the team's part, especially if you know other teams aren't doing it. Um, which is a really, really good move on the team's part because I was looking at like NFL stuff the other day and somebody you made mean like every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but, but. So but somebody was mentioning how the newer NFL is more. It should be based on the coach. Right. The head coach. Yeah. He's the one that should install the offense. He's the one that should be calling plays because, well, the turnover, uh, a lot of coordinators will get head coaching jobs, especially in now it's such an offensive league. Right. Your offensive coordinator is going to be new head coaches. And we saw this with the Niners. Well, not really with the Niners, but we got Atlanta's offensive coordinator, Kyle Shanahan. Yep. And the next year, their team was awful because he was a brain behind that offense. Yeah, definitely. And we're going to see that tenfold in the AAF. Not only is this a league for the players, is a leak for the coaches. Which I hadn't thought about until you said that. Mm -hmm. This is something Cochet said at the watch party, but if they're doing their job, what is it, like the top 10% of players will leave? I think that's what their idea is. They'll get pulled up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and same thing for the coaches. So if your offensive coordinator gets called to the NFL, well, we still have Singletary, and he's the one running the offense. It's his vision. So like our system doesn't change. Right. And then kind of similar to the players, because another question I think it was you that asked was. Right? Yeah, somebody mentioned like leadership on the team, like how important is. or OK, somebody, one of the other uh, fans at the watch party asked Koshe, what is like going into the draft? What is the team's goal as far as player leadership? Exactly. And he said that because of this turnover, because 10 percent of players will get pulled up if they're doing their jobs right. Um, and what did he say? Like 20 like, yeah, yeah, and like the bottom 20% is going to be cut just because, you know, they're not, they don't have the talent to make it. Right. So something that they're looking for in a leader is someone that's going to be consistent. He's not going to be your top player, which you're probably going to lose. And he's not going to obviously be a bottom player that's going to get cut. He's going to be somewhere right in the middle that's going to be consistent on the team over a period of time. Yeah, which is why it makes so much sense that the fleet went with Josh Johnson first overall is because he's a guy that's been in the league for years. So he's got the experience of leadership and something that the younger players can look up to, but he's not somebody that's probably going to ever get called back to the NFL. And I think the biggest elephant in the room was the fact that Zach Mettenberger was drafted so late in the draft. Yeah. Well, not only, okay, this, this was the most shocking thing. Well, 
to everyone that wasn't on the team or like yeah. if you're not Coche or Mike Singletary or Will Lewis, this was pretty much shocking. Um, Memphis's first pick comes up in the first round. We all expected them to protect and they did, but it was not Zach Mettenberger who was overwhelmingly the like, fan choice. Yeah. It was arguably the safest pick for our first pick. Yeah. I mean, so when it came across, it said Troy Cook. Like, I, what? I know my mouth was, I mean, my jaw was just dropped. Like I was shocked because I... I didn't really do my part. And I didn't research these guys before we went into it because we do the podcast and I was like, I'll learn, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I really have no idea who Troy Cook is. I know he played at UT Martin. Yeah. And luckily, Koshe was standing right next to us when that when that uh, pick came through. So we were able to ask him some questions. Yeah. And it's just weird, I guess is the right word. Confusing. I don't know. So it, I'd be interested in getting some feedback from the coaches as to why the NFL guys, the guys with this experience, Scott Tolson, Christian Hackenberg, Zach Mettenberger, went so late and all these unknown names got drafted earlier. I think back to Mettenberger for a quick second. I have some questions about why he was invited in the first place, because if they weren't intending to draft him in the first or second round, I mean, he was in that stupid quarterback box by himself. I mean, yeah, it was just painful. And, and I think going through Twitter and seeing the reactions to that, I think that's a, a huge opinion from a lot of people is that was painful to watch. So I wonder if he pissed someone off or something happened to make him kind of be treated that way. That I feel like that wasn't right. So that was my initial reaction was if nobody's going to draft him until so late, why even invite him out? Why not just say like we invited Zach Mattenberger. He had something come up. I don't make some excuse. Right. So it's not like you just snubbed him. Uh, but the more I thought about, it, the more I realized how could you communicate that? Right. Yeah, because I guess it's true. Like the teams aren't talking to each other like, well, we're going to draft these guys and we're going to draft these guys because you just don't do that. Yeah. As much as this is an alliance, it's an alliance of individual <laughs> teams. <laughs> right. And when the general consensus is Memphis is taking Mettenberger first overall and Memphis is like, yeah, you probably shouldn't invite Mettenberger. Then that really tips the hand of what Memphis is doing. And then maybe uh, somebody else is like, OK, maybe we should pick up the Troy Cook guy because maybe Memphis is looking at him. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought about that because yeah. he was so overwhelmingly thought to be the one they had to take him to be a decoy. But OK, so Memphis didn't pick him, but no one else did either in like the first few rounds. Yeah. So th something had to have happened at the camp or maybe in an interview. Yeah. And we talked about it on the interview with Isaac. It's his he surmised that maybe it was his work work ethic, which has been an issue for him, his career. Yeah. So, there could be a lot there. Maybe they don't want an apathetic player in a league like this. They need guys who are driven. And you get that drive from the players that never made it to the NFL. Yeah. Because they're hungry. But then you have Menberger who made it but didn't really make it. Right. Yeah. And so maybe he doesn't have that drive anymore. So I think it's going to make for a very interesting QB battle with the team. I, I have a lot of questions. And I want to see that um, mini camp. I want to go and like yeah. see how things pan out and do you think he's getting zach bentenberger at this point is going to make it to the 52 the final 52 uh, based on what we know about how the team feels about troy cook very passionate and the fact that they let him go to the fourth round and the fact that no other team got him it seems like mentenberger is at the bottom well something else that about mentenberger he calls himself a pocket quarterback i mean and i guess it's important to like know what kind of player you are mm -hmm. but Football is moving to completely mobile. I yeah. mean, ever since I've really been interested in football, quarterbacks don't really stay in the pocket. And those that do aren't doing well. It doesn't seem like. Well, I mean, if you look at the greats, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger, they're not Russell Wilson. Right. But you still have Russell Wilson, Cam Newton, Lamar Jackson, who Carl are Kaepernick. Yeah. yeah. I mean, completely mobile. Yeah. And even Aaron Rodgers, he's a pocket passer. But he's not some he's somebody that can get out of the pocket and move around. Exactly. And that's especially something that we get with Troy Cook. It's his ability to get out of the pocket, extend plays and throw on the run and make some tight throws on the run. I need to watch his highlights. I haven't done that yet. Yeah, we're going to I'll link it to the show notes. That way, if you guys haven't seen our new quarterback, then definitely check it out because it is pretty good to see. Yeah, for sure. Is that all we got? That's all I got. All righty. Uh, so be sure to subscribe to the show if you haven't already, because Obviously, we have some really good content. Best podcast for the AAF. Ever. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. Okay, guys. Campaign. I am sitting at like 980-something followers on Twitter. Whoop, like, whoop. holy shit. Uh, help me get to 1,000 because 
why the fuck not? Maybe we'll do a giveaway. There we go. Figure something out. 1K so. giveaway. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. So uh, give me to 1,000 and we'll do a giveaway. There we go. All right. But that is our show for this week. Uh, until next time. Thanks for hanging out. Get them out. You guys actually listen to this far in the episode? Let us know on Twitter. <laughs> I love to do these little, we call it the outro outros. Yeah. Uh, so I'd love to know if you guys ever make it this far. Because there's one in every episode, but it just. Uh... <laughs> it's a little gem for those that stick around. Yeah. Just like so, this. Enjoy this. Enjoy this. <laughs>